Hello and welcome back to Kitco Mining's Digging Deep with me, Paul Harris, in which we take a closer look at some of the most interesting news items in the mining space this past week. Joining me today is Neil Ladshead, Consultant Analyst at the Commodity Discovery Fund. Neil, welcome to Kitco. Thanks, Paul. Thanks very much. Great to be here. Now, please note, Digging Deep is not investment advice and the opinions expressed here are our own and not Kitco's. Uh, Neil, looking at our agenda, this is going to be a, a tour de force. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. That's good, yeah. I look forward to it. Well, let's start with gold. The yellow metal powered past $2,200 US per ounce uh, briefly this week. Um, and yet you wouldn't notice that by uh, looking at the gold equities. There's still no love for gold stocks. Why do you think that is? No, that's true. Yeah, you know, I, I gave this, I've, I've given this a bit of thought for years, actually, because um, I used to work for a gold mining company uh, started about 30 years ago, and then I joined the buy side uh, 20 years ago. And when I joined, I was working for an investment group out of San Francisco, and he was more of a, he's really a generalist. And he, he kind of discovered gold as this sort of insu financial insurance for his, um, you know, for his portfolio. And what often happens with these generalists, they discover gold, and then they, then they learn about gold equities, and they think they can still get the protection that gold gives them from uh, owning the owning the miners of the gold. Now that's all well and good. And back back then in the in the noughties, I suppose it would would have been two thousand five, two thousand six. You would get a good premium. You know these things would trade at a P now of sort of one point five to two, even higher at, at times. But what's happened over over the last fifteen years or so? That P nav multiple has certainly declined to being more like you know point five to point eight these days. And you know I've thought about why is that. And, you know, today, uh, gold miners, especially when you compare them, say, to iron ore or copper miners, they don't really make the same sort of margins as an iron ore miner or a copper miner. And that's why the big boys, the BHPs and the Rio Tintos of this world, don't really mine gold. They don't set out to mine gold. So the, there's actually an economic geology reason why I think the gold miners don't make as much money as what, um, you know, and that, hence because of that, because they're not generating huge margins. Uh, they tend to underperform financially and they just don't generate the returns of some other mining companies. And I think because of that, because of sort of reality has bitten over the last 10 years or so, the returns have been relatively poor and consequently the, the multiples have shrunk. Even though the gold price has risen, I even spoke to a gold company this week. He says, yeah, it's all well and good, $2,200 an ounce. But our costs have actually kept pace with the rise in the gold price, so we're not actually making any more money. It does seem to be, you know, the gold sector is trying to, I won't say rediscover itself, but it's trying to find a way to be relevant to investors, as you say, given all these competing forces. And I guess there was another one this week, uh, another news item. Reddit IPO'd on the New York Stock Exchange this week. It opened 70% higher, reached a higher 58 US dollars per share and an $8.9 billion valuation. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I use that as an example because there's a lot of, competition or, or distraction from the, the technology sector yeah no the the competition is a good is a good uh topic because you know back in the day 20 years ago 15 years ago there was no such thing as a cryptocurrency you know people especially younger people maybe today are buying cryptocurrency because they see it as this store of value which may, maybe older people have seen gold as the store of value but obviously the generations are changing here you know bitcoin now has this uh I'm not sure the exact number, but it must be close to a trillion dollar market cap. You know, maybe back in the day, a lot of that money would have come into into the gold sector, bought gold or bought gold equities for that uh, that leverage. But today, there's an alternative. So yeah, gold unfortunately is a little bit unloved, especially the uh, the gold producers. And that's perhaps got a, a little bit more acute or, or worse recently with the uh, the arrival of crypto ETFs. You now have got. Uh, um, that's yeah. perhaps a more of a bona fide financial instrument in which generous investors can invest and get exposure to crypto. Well, I suppose the ETFs, especially when they're backed by a big, a big financial firm, uh, you know, give it a bit more credibility rather than you sort of trading through some, you know, supposed dodgy platform. You know, these ETFs are quite liquid, and the the the, the generalist who maybe has only got, you know, the the retail guy who's only got, you know, a couple of thousand dollars to put in the in the market sees it now as a, a bit more of a legitimate investment. Okay, let's um, dig a little bit deeper <clears throat> into the, the malaise that the, the gold stocks and the gold sector 
is, is in. Um, there's a lot of data out this week from S&P Global Market Intelligence. Um, one data point that they reported the decline in the number of holes drilled uh, this year compared to the prior year. The total number of gold holes drilled has dropped from 8,152 to 5,352. That's about a 40% reduction. Holes drilled for copper and lithium are also down. Um, what's the driving factor here, Neil? I mean, there's several potential reasons. I'm not sure of the exact reason. I'm not sure you can come up with one explanation for the whole the whole decline. Yeah, that, that data was spanning the first two months of 2024 compared to the first two months of 2023. Uh, I think one obvious reason, and the juniors would probably agree with this, is that, you know, you need money to drill holes. So uh, there's probably a little bit less money available out there. Um, because it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere, maybe it wasn't as cold this year as last year when it's not as cold. It's a bit harder to, it's a bit harder to get your rig out and drill if you're drilling in swamps or, or drilling off lakes. Um, but interestingly, in that data, the the decline in the number of drill holes, as well as being significant, it was actually across all commodities. So you couldn't really say it was due to, you know, one theme being hot and one other theme not being hot. So, yeah, a bit a bit worrying for discoveries, a bit worrying for the industry. If you know, drill holes are the are the lifeblood of discoveries, and uh, if you drill less over time, we will discover less. We're going to talk a little bit more about this uh, later in our conversation as we start talking about resource nationalism and copper. Um, but uh, before we get to that, um, S&P released other information this week. It said the average lead time to get a mining reduction continues to trend upward. Um, the average now, it said, is 17.9 years for a mine coming online in the 2020 to 2023 period, compared with 12.7 years for mines that started up 15 years ago. Um, that's quite worrying in many ways, isn't it? Uh, we're looking at a, a copper supply deficit and not just copper, but with mines <laughs> taking longer to come on stream, um, that whole, the whole risk of development is just sort of growing or, or spreading over a longer period of time. Yeah, 100%. You're seeing that quite a lot now. I mean, in Canada is a good example in that a lot of the recent gold mines, they've had trouble, uh, you know, it's been quite slow to permit, slow to finance and, um, Definitely, there's been execution issues, and a lot of them haven't actually delivered on the on the time frame they said when they were going to get going. We've seen big capex blowouts. You know, that's quite a long topic. We could get into you know the reasons for that. I mean, on a, on a, on on the flip side, I suppose the optimistic angle of that is saying, well, if supply is taking longer to come on, we should see ultimately a significant rise in metal prices as the as the supply is crimped, and you know, uh, uh, great the you know as the metal prices increase. It'll attract more investors into the sector and that ultimately a lot of that will feed down into the juniors and ultimately the supply will catch up. I mean, the, we all know the, the, um, the mining industry and the commodity cycles, this is super cyclical industry. So, you know, there is, there's, there's, there's always a little bit of a, a, a silver lining there with some of these delays. Um, but, you know, to take 17 years from a discovery to first production, it's pretty hard these days for somebody to buy a discovery and think you're going to hold the stock on average, for 15 years before you become a producer. That, that's quite a bit of foresight or quite a, quite a planning cycle. And there was an example related to that this week with Calibri Mining. They uh, announced a new uh, 100 million US dollar bought deal financing. Um, that's to have funds, more funds available for, to continue and finish the, the marathon, uh, sorry, the, the Valentine Gold Deposit Development in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada. Um, and the previous owner, that was Marathon Gold, and they ran into exactly the kind of issues that uh, you just talked about, Neil. Yeah, sure. Now, you know, some people might say, why are they raising 100 million uh, Canadian right now? Um, I, you know, you should always, another way, to, another way to look at that is that I often say, to, especially to juniors, you know, if the market's offering you money at OK terms, you, sh you should take it. You know, the terms on that deal, they raise money. There is 100 million at 168. I think the last time that they did a, a chunky raise as an independent company, this is before the marathon merger, it was almost five years ago, and they raised money at 60 cents. So to now raise money at 168, you know, it's a bought deal, no warrants, 5% uh, commission. Um, you know, so it's a good deal. I, I actually think it was a, a wise deal. It was wise they raised the money right now. And I wouldn't be surprised, as I, as I mentioned in the last topic, wouldn't be surprised if maybe the schedule on the, the cost and the time potentially might slip a little bit 
on building the mine. Therefore, it's just prudent now for the company to take the money. You no, know, the money was offered, bought a deal, they should take it. I think the company said when it reported its 2023 results a couple of weeks ago that uh, it will be giving a, an update, a performance update on Valentine in the coming weeks or months. Um, one final comment uh, related to that S&P average mine lead time growth. One of the surprises for me in, in the list was that the, the USA was one of the quickest or speediest jurisdictions. I think it was fourth from bottom or, mm. or the fourth quickest in terms of uh, being able to get mines into production, which I think would surprise many people hearing that, given that uh, you've got a quite an extensive NEPA process for a lot of projects or, or projects that are on federal land. Yeah, that surprised me. I, I'd be interested uh, on, the ba- on the basis of that, maybe I should go look at the data and see see what mines they were talking about in the US, because I, I would have thought the US would be more the end of the, you know, one of the slowest jurisdictions. Now, some, you know, the, the fast jurisdictions I've experienced in the last 10 years or so have actually been in West Africa, funnily enough. Um, you know, some people think West Africa is this, you know, risky, scary place. Uh, but I, I've got three or four examples of juniors I've, I've backed uh, in various firms where from discovery to first production, it was within six to seven years. Um, you know, which is probably setting all sorts of records, all sorts of records today. And the reasoning I came up, you know, why they did that was one, the deposit quality, especially for gold, you know, these, these are relatively high grade open pits. They're relatively simple to permit. But a big thing, which not many people, you know, a lot of people think this is a negative thing is that in West Africa, the different governments tend to own 10 or 20% of the, of the project and have a royalty and receive tax. And they are fairly pro-mining. So when, when your regulator also owns a significant piece of your asset and is going to benefit financially, it's funny how fast they tend to permit them. Well, that begs the question then, Neil, doesn't it? Um, if that's a, a method that works well in West Africa, why don't mining companies look to spread that to other parts of the world where they're having perhaps slower permitting times and, and more resistance? Maybe governments in, say, I mean, let's call them democratic capitalist countries, maybe they don't like to be seen to be um, openly supporting or, or even having ownership of a mining project. It's probably seen as being maybe politically not very, um, very attractive. But on that note, I saw an article this morning, I think it was on mining.com, stating that the United States government in the last few months has basically given grants and loans of 500 million US dollars to mining companies to bring on uh, especially critical minerals projects in the US and in countries which have a, a trade deal with the US. So it's quite a, kind of interesting what's going on in recent recent months that we are seeing more taxpayer government, you know, taxpayer funded government supported uh, financing of mine development. It is a fascinating subject, and that's a nice segue into our next topic of uh, resource nationalism, or perhaps to be more precise, resource noism. First quantum in Copy mm. Panama last year, obviously a very high profile example. Uh, this past week, there's more news out from Northern Dynasty in its saga to try and advance to a permitting stage for its Pebble project in Alaska. And we had the news that Gabriel Resources lost its arbitration case against the Romanian government regarding the Russia Montana project. Um, NIMBYism. Let's start yeah. there. NIMBYism. Yeah. Yeah, and NIMBY is mind. one way to say it. Yeah, another way is, um, you know, some governments, every, it, well, maybe I'll start, take a step back. Every one of these cases is unique. You know, the, the Pebble case is over, essentially over fisheries. Um, you know, Gabriel, the, the Roger Montana story in Romania there, he's sort of related to who really, who really owns that gold, you know, and, 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 and a weak federal government. And then obviously Cobre Panama is still in the news. It's going into arbitration. You know, there's various explanations as to what really went wrong there. So uh, nimbyism is one of them, uh, you know, is one, maybe one word to use. Um, I just think there's not really often an alignment between the government and the people who voted the government in. And, it, and the government will often crumple when there's, you know, sufficient opposition, powerful lobbying to say, do not, you know, do not build this mining project. But also it's generally in countries that, maybe don't really have a strong mining culture. You know, you could say Panama doesn't really have a strong mining culture. And it all comes as a bit of a shock to the people when they see this big hole in the ground, but don't really appreciate the economic uh, revenue and support and benefits that are, that are going to flow from that, you know, impressive mine for the next 50 years. 
So does that go back to what we talked about previously, what you mentioned about West Africa? So just for the sake of argument, if First Quantum had given the the Panama, the state of Panama, you know, a good royalty, 10% ownership, maybe the same thing with Russia, Montana, um, the outcome would have been different. Uh, I think the outcome possibly would have been a lot better and it wouldn't have got to the point it got to. Yeah. You know, there's there's all sorts of examples. Like there's a good example in, you know, the way the Egyptian system works. You know, Sentamin basically only owns half of the mine and the Egyptian government owns half the mine. So Sentamin, you know, took a lot of uh, risk by building the mine, but they were allowed to recoup all their capital uh, before the Egyptian government essentially took 50% of the profits. And it's it has turned out to be a big win-win. That's, uh, you know, a big a big mine in the global scheme of things. The Egyptian government has made a lot of money out of it. Sentamin shareholders have made a lot of money out of it. So there's all sorts of different uh, structures that you can do whereby the government and the people on one side, because ultimately nearly everywhere in the world, the mineral rights are owned by the state and the state essentially is owned by the people. So unless, unless the people feel like they're getting significant benefit from any sort of resource extraction, whether it's you know, timber, oil and gas, fisheries, anything, then there will be it's, um, you know, a sufficient degree of opposition that's not always environmentally driven. It can, have, can, have, um, can quite often be fiscally driven. Yeah, sharing the benefits. Yeah. One jurisdiction that is open to mining investment at the moment is San Juan in Argentina. I was there this week and I, I met with Governor Marcelo Orego. He was very clear that he wants to develop the mining sector and related industries. And with President Millet working on improving the macroeconomic and financial conditions, San Juan could become a copper mining hotspot from the end of the decade. What's your thoughts uh, about the, the rise of San Juan as a, a copper mining jurisdiction? Well, there's certainly, I mean, I met the um, the Mendoza team recently and I met the governor of Mendoza. So there is a bit of a, you know, a lot of Argentinian provinces are out there trying to attract investment right now. I mean, I think Argentina in general, not specifically talking about San Juan, you know, it's still got a bit of a perception challenge for foreign direct investment, uh, especially on, say, copper and gold. But there has been, you know, there has been some investment. Um, you know, Fortuna built the Lindero mine, and there's been a lot of money plowing into the lithium sector. So there is there is mine development in Argentina. Whether a company, I mean, I was going to say whether a company is going to be brave enough to, you know, invest $5 billion US building a big copper mine in the Andes and the Argentinian Andes, you know, and, under uh, the perception of Argentina today, especially what's just happened with Cobre Panama. Um, I'm not so sure that's going to happen in the next five years, let's say. But, you know, if Argentina keeps making the right noises, especially the more mining friendly provinces, and I hope to visit Argentina myself later this year to check it out for myself, uh, then who knows, maybe in 10 years time, Argentina may be an up and coming um, yeah. copper producer again, because I believe uh, Argentina currently has zero copper production. Well, I think uh, in, in a relatively short space of time, we should be able to answer some of those questions because Landin Mining is looking uh, is pushing ahead to or looking to push ahead to get its Jose Maria deposit in production. You've got Mercure Mining with Los Azules and also uh, Glencore at Mara. They're all multi-billion dollar investments and they're all you know, working closely with the government to try and get to that uh, investment decision yeah. stage. Now, um, Noism um, is perhaps, I imagine, why a lot of the copper producers, the majors, prefer brownfield developments, you know, adding on something to one of their existing yeah. mines uh, quicker and easier. And I think we're also seeing noism in the exploration and development companies. Um, it's perhaps causing them to reshift their focus back to jurisdictions like Canada and the USA. And we had a, a couple of examples this week on, on both of those points. And of gas and minerals obtained a $2.5 billion um, loan for, a, for its $4.4 billion second concentrated development at the Sentinella project, a brownfield project there. And uh, Junior Explorer in Terra Copper announced it's pulling out of Chile. In addition to not finding copper at its Tres Marias target, <coughs> it said Chile has proven to be of decreasing attractiveness over the past 12 to 18 months, culminating with what amounts to be a burdensome tax on exploration ventures and capital, as the government increased the annual claim fees to maintain concessions, which for Intera amounted to unacceptable overhead costs. What's your view of what's happening in Chile there? Um, I mean, Chile specifically, yeah, just, just, I mean, I suppose more of a general comment is I, as an investor, I mean, people often ask me about a jurisdiction 
Now, one one sort of generic tool I use is I, I, I essentially look at how healthy the the junior exploration sector ecosystem is of of any jurisdiction. So rather than rushing to look at Crisis Group or Transparency International or something like that, I just say I just see how many juniors are operating there, you know, and who's generating, how many of them are generating results, or how many of them are sitting on their hands. Now, Chile Chile's always been an exploration jurisdiction. I've always seen juniors operating there, and I, I still see them operating there today. But hearing stories like that make me, you know, make me question how how good Chile really is. But but it's quite funny. You do see jurisdictions do you know wax and wane in their popularity. So for example, you know, talking about Chile neighbor, you know, maybe ten years ago, fifteen years ago, there's basically nothing happening in Bolivia, for example. Whereas today, if you looked at around the Bolivian junior sector, there's probably a good ten to fifteen juniors that are pretty active. So that that suggests to me, Bolivia as a jurisdiction is very welcoming at the moment to uh, juniors. Whereas may, maybe Chile, unfortunately, is by the sounds of it, is potentially swinging the other way slightly. You know, I'm not I'm not suggesting Chile's going 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 bad. Um, you know, I need to do a little bit of work as to see who's working there. So, for example, you know, Pampa Metals put out some interesting draw results recently. So there is there is still activity there. You know, there's lots of uh, development potential in Chile. The the London Group's having a lot of success there. So yeah, you know, I can't I can't really say Chile's going that good or that bad at the moment, but it's definitely one to watch. And I'd, I'd watch it by just seeing the junior exploration activity in the country. I think it could be a, a case of bad timing to a certain extent. Um, I recently wrote a, a feature article looking at just looking at the copper junior explorers in Chile and how they're faring. And one of the conclusions, uh, obvious conclusions there was because of the, the poor state of the financing markets, the equity markets for juniors, they're not really able to raise enough money to do you mm-hmm. know, really good, strong, solid drill campaigns. So doing a thousand meters here, a thousand meters there. So their, their rate of progress has slowed dramatically and uh, obviously, time is money, and if you're if you're not drilling, you're not producing results. That can be the the kiss of death for a, for a junior. No, that's a very good point, and that's actually a crucial point I often look at when I'm when I'm evaluating a junior for a for as an investment point of view. You know that it's nice that you know the 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 people are good guys, they're credible, they have a decent business plan, but then they they show me the business plan. I'm going, okay, these guys need five, ten, fifteen million dollars to to have a good go here. And they tell me they're raising two. Um, now, if they can only raise two, the problem is either either the market's really weak, or they're not raising enough money out of choice for whatever reason, or they just don't have the ability to raise money. And even just based on that, based on them being undercapitalized, that greatly increases their risk of failure. So I tend tend not to invest. So. You know, exploration is getting more expensive. Um, people were telling me a couple of weeks ago, it's now almost 500 US dollars a meter to drill in Nevada. You know, so that's pretty chunky. If you're, you're talking about drilling a 500 meter hole and you're going to do six of them, you know, you want to make sure you've got a significant amount of money. Otherwise, just drilling one hole and hoping to come back to the market for some money is uh, greatly increases your odds of failure, unfortunately. Oh, I want to sort of touch on another aspect um Neil, and get your thoughts on that because, you know, um, I'm going to throw out the question, uh, do a lot of the copper junior explorers, have they got the wrong strategy? Um, what do I mean by that? I had an interesting conversation with a copper analyst this week who said the copper major, majors don't want to buy juniors as doing a takeout with a premium makes it hard for them to, to meet their return on investment hurdle rate uh, mm-hmm. to green light of development. So they prefer to let juniors advance, get distressed and then come in um, with a strategic investment at a project level. Um, that sounds yep. bad for juniors, but uh, um, it also suggests that juniors that are targeting copper porphyries, which take a lot of drilling, a lot of drill holes, and therefore a lot of money uh, to to advance, it is perhaps the wrong game for them now. I agree. Yeah, no, uh, you know, when a junior is telling you they're going to be drilling a thousand meter holes, you know, depending on where they are, certain parts of the world, those holes can be costing you a million dollars. And even if you, another way I look at it is even if you hit Say you hit 500 meters at 0.5%, but it's starting, you know, 500 meters down hole. How are you ever going to drill off an indicated resource at that kind of depth, you know, with a $50 million market cap? You're not. So once it once it gets to that level, I really want to, especially if I'm an investor, I, I really want to see the junior talking about bringing in a partner who's got a very, very big balance sheet who can do that kind of drilling. So 
trying to rely on the capital markets when you've got a very, very high unit cost of exploration. Unfortunately, you're greatly increasing your probability of hurting your shareholders' performance just due to excessive uh, equity dilution. Okay. Well, one final um, thing to talk about, I think, Neil. Um, we, we mentioned that gold hit $2,200 per ounce this week. Copper nudged above $4 per pound yeah. this week briefly. Um, is copper finally starting to make its move? Uh, I hope so. I mean, copper has to. I, I'm not sure if anybody's put out a recent um, incentive price for a, you know, a sizable, say, a 100,000 ton a year copper mine, but it probably has to be higher than sustainably higher than $4 a pound. Um, you know, copper producers are making an okay return right now, but to induce a new copper mine, and these copper mines tend to be well, much more sizable than a gold mine, and they require a lot more capital, you know, often in the billions of dollars of capital. Um, again, Cobre Panama is going to make some of the big companies of the world, the big boards, sorry, the boards of these big companies think a little bit, you know, think long and hard about whether they're going to put $5 billion into a, let's call it a developing nation to build a copper asset that they might actually lose in five years' time once they've built it. So the, I see copper going significantly higher. I mean, you probably had other guests on the, on the show saying the same thing. I have exposure to several copper companies myself. And yeah, I'm a, I'm a copper bull. Sounds like everybody's a copper bull these days, but we're just waiting for the, waiting for the price to react. Well, let's leave it there, Neil, on that positive note. Thank you very much for joining us this week. No problem. Thank you. Cheers, Paul. And we'll be having Neil back uh, again in a, in a few weeks' time. I'm Paul Harris, digging deep for Kitco Mining. And if you like what you see, don't forget to subscribe.